Hey, Dave, this is Forever Blue. This is Excess Manchester 106.1 FM. I'm Ian Cheeseman. Alongside me is the legend that is Paul Dickoff. And the party continues. It started with the Swansea game, Paul. And it feels as if there's going to be party after party now because there's two more home games. It's the parade. But it's great to have a non-stop party, isn't it? It is parties home and away. A couple of away um, games for the fans to go and enjoy as well. Um, but obviously, I've seen you at the game on Sunday and performance again was magnificent. But But what an atmosphere. You know, it's just great for me. Um, obviously, playing when the club weren't doing very well to see to see where they are now. You know, to go out there and play the football that they're playing, but to see the fans um, being able to relax and enjoy being Premier League champions, just brilliant. Most of the people will know you and you know of your career and know of know of your history. There might just be one or two, uh, but obviously, you and, and that team of 1999. Without you and that team, and I remember we did a dinner for the Variety Club years ago. I think you were at that dinner, weren't you? Pretty much everybody was there, including Mark Halsey and and Joe and and all the rest of it. Um, you know that that team. Where would we be without the, the heroes of '99? Are being remembered. I mean, you know, I, I glibly said, you know, we won't be here without you, Paul. And a few people commented it on the vlog, on the vlog. Sorry, the vlog, on the vlog. Uh, but, it, you know, the bottom line is that City have come from there and I think, although there are new fans coming along and we welcome those new fans all around the world, there is still a core of City supporters, a great core, who value where they came from and actually make all this joy that is now being spread around by the Blues and by this great team even more enjoyable. It is, and it's it's a strange one. I was, actually, I was speaking to my, my, my boys um, after the game on Sunday and... Obviously, going into the ground, people are stopping you and shaking your hand and thanking you, which I get quite embarrassed about, you know, because um, there was another squad of players that played in that game as well, and, and who were all top boys. You know, the one thing I'll say about that team is the team spirit and the camaraderie we had was was second to none. Um, but I probably get stopped more now than I did ten years ago, um, and getting asked about the Gillingham game, and a lot of people tend to forget about the Blackburn game, the back-to-back promotions. And the squad that was involved, you know, that was a majority of the squad that was in the 99 promotion team that there was in the, the 2001 that to go back to the Premier League. Um, and I think it's because of how successful the club are now. I think people appreciate it more, um, what that what it meant to, to have the back-to-back promotions in. Um, you know, maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago when the club were still sort of up and down and, and consistently not playing anywhere near the football that they're playing now I think people appreciate it more now and it's nice but I do get embarrassed about it you know Kevin Orlock was there on Sunday um, Michael Brown Tony Vaughan Andy Morrison Edgy Bob Brightwell you know and it's great to see them all because um, as much as we had a great bond then we still have now but the biggest bond we had was with the fans Well this team is getting lots of plaudits understandably obviously all these awards in the PFA as well finally finally it seems that they're getting the, the credit they deserve uh, one of the, the things that was very enjoyable as well was Yaya Toure coming on. I know he's not played a big part this season, but he sent over that beautiful ball that Gabriel Jesus finished. And it just reminds you of, of the role that he's played, that the quality he still has. He might be a little bit slower, he might be a yard or two slower, but he still sees the game s- s- superbly, doesn't he? Yeah, absolute legend. And, and what a servant to the club. Um, you know, for probably f- four or five years, he was unplayable. You know, um, when he was at his best, nobody could get anywhere near him. He would look as if he he wasn't particularly running very fast, and he would sprint 60 yards and score a goal or set up a goal. And just a phenomenal player. And, and I'll always take it back to the fans. The reception um, he got, one down at Tottenham when he came in the pitch, and the reception he got for the fans and on, on Sunday was made the hair stand up in the back of my neck. But, but that's what City fans are all about. They they appreciate every single player that's played for them, and appreciate players that have done well for them as well. 50 years since 68. Uh, I can remember just about the 68 team. Obviously, I, wa- I watched them play, um, but I wasn't there in, I can. at Newcastle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're only a little nipper. Uh, but up at Newcastle, when they won that the title, it was on the last day of the season. Obviously, the, the 2012 was last day of the season, last moment of the season. Same thing happened in 2014. This was completely new. A guard of honour at the Etihad from the opposition. That was unprecedented, and it, it might only seem a little thing, but... That's felt really special to me. It was, it was special for me, and I, I touched on it before, but for me to sit back and watch the game on Sunday and, and see the City fans actually enjoying their team play, knowing that they were champions, it, it was a special one. I'm sure it was for all the City fans who have been, been um, lifelong Blues, to be able to go to the game, knowing that your team's champions, not leaving it to the last minute, the, the City ways, as, as people say, um, but to just go and enjoy watching their team, knowing that they are Premier League champions and knowing that they are the best team in the country.
What a performance as well. It was, and um, before the game, I was getting asked a lot of questions about, you know, they've won the league sometimes when teams have won the league, they take their foot off the gas. I don't, we were touching it last week in the show, I don't think there was any danger of that ever happening. Um, there's too much desire, and there's too many winners in, in the team, in the squad, and in the management for that to happen. And they've still got records that are going great. And it's just it's refreshing for me, every interview I've seen this season, they always talk about, whether it be the players or the coaching staff or the manager, they always talk about being better. We want to be better. What's the next thing we can do? What's the next record we can beat? And when you're talk like that, but that's what makes you world-class players. You, you don't rest in your laurels. You know, a lot of players, a lot of teams would have won the league. They would have been out there, and you know, there's that phrase on the beach, you know, which is put out a long time. That, that I just can't see that ever happening with this team with Pep Guardiola in charge. Obviously, there was a great goal in that game by Kevin De Bruyne, as good a goal as probably we've seen. Certainly, in the way it was struck. Uh, we've, we're going to talk to David Phillips a little later on who struck a few like that for City anybody that remembers back to the mid 80s when he played a couple of seasons then he used to strike them quite regularly like that but to see Kevin De Bruyne have such an impact on the game to strike a goal like that um, he hasn't scored for a little while but he set a record I think for the, the most strikes from outside the penalty area this season um, just again underlines what a season he's had um, I don't think we're going to forget, you and I, but he got overlooked in the, the Player of the Year with Mo Salah, of course, winning that. W- was that the right decision? Would you, would you have gone for De Bruyne? Or? Uh, personally, I would have went for De Bruyne. Um, but obviously, I've got to take my, my blue tinted glasses off sometimes. And I can understand why Mo Salah got it, you know, to have over 40 goals in, in all competitions. And it's, it's always the goal scorers that, that get the credit and the glory. But f- for Mo Salah to do it, playing in a wide position as well, you know, he's got to take a lot of credit. But as an all-round player, an all-round performance, he's an all-round influence on the team. For, for me, Kevin De Bruyne has been sensational since day one. And yeah, I'm going to ask you a strange question now, right? Because we're talking about Kevin De Bruyne and should he be been player of the year. Who is City's player of the year? Because, you know, it's not quite as cut and dried as, well, if Kevin De Bruyne was the challenger for Mo Salah, then it's got to be him. I know some people will say it is him, but it's a lot closer than that, isn't it? It is, and it, it changes every week when you <laughs> see the performances. But just just going back to Kevin De Bruyne not winning, I don't think that'll bother him one bit. Oh, no. He is such a team player. You know, we can talk about how fantastic he is, his assists, the goals he scored. If you watch him for 90 minutes and you see how hard he works for the team, with the ball, but more more without the ball, he's always closing players down. He's the catalyst for a lot of the press that they do as well, and, and he's, he's just an unbelievable team player. A lot of players that would bother, they would be... They would be absolutely gutted that they've not got Player of the Year, but I don't think it'll bother Kevin De Bruyne one bit. As in, Player of the Year this season, I think you've got to look at... It's hard to see past Kevin De Bruyne, but then David Silva's been, been sensational, especially especially with, um, obviously, his little boy, God bless him, um, having the problems that he did with his birth. That to put in the performances and not necessarily train all the time just shows you what a top player and top professional that he is. Um, I think Ederson's up there. Um, I think he's yet again been sensational. You want to see him take a penalty before the end of the season then? Do you know what? If I was, a, I heard the fans singing that. If I was a centre forward and I was on the pitch and the goalkeeper took the penalty, I'd be raging. You know, Gabriel Jesus wants to score goals. Whoever takes the penalties wants to score goals. Nothing against Ederson, but keep the goalkeepers away, please. Really? <laughs> well, you see, when you come to penalty shootouts in big World Cups and all the rest of it, and they have to pick five penalty takers, there have been occasions, on mo- more than one, where the main striker of that team hasn't actually taken a penalty. So you as a striker, would you always have wanted to take absolutely, a penalty? Yeah, absolutely. So what, 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 why, why is it sometimes I, I, I they don't? I don't know is the answer to that. Um, you know, if I was playing, I wanted to score, whether it was off my backside, whether it, wherever it came from, whether it was a penalty, it didn't bother me at all. Not that it happened very often, <laughs> mate. you. Um, but, uh, yeah, penalties, we'll leave that to the outfield players. Um Player of the Year, I think, um, for different reasons, Fabian Delph has to have a shout. Um, looked as if he was leaving in the summer, had a few injuries, um, forced his way back into a position that he'd never played in his career before and played ever so well every time he's been there. Um, you could go through the whole team. Fernandinho's got to be a shout too, hasn't he? Yeah, I was saving him to last. <laughs> um, Nicholas Otamendi, um, although he's not maybe played every game, Vincent Company has been sensational, especially the, the back end of the season. His leadership qualities, um, what it means to him to win the Premier League. He's like you, a bigger version of you, isn't he? A much bigger version of me, yeah. (laughs) And a much quicker version of me as well. Um, But he's just, 
it's what he gives on the pitch, what he gives to the fans, and what he gives off the pitch has has just been sensational. The whole package, uh, and he's he is he's city through and through. You know, he's a leader. Fernandinho has just been sensational. Um, I love him. He doesn't always get the the plaudits that he should do. Um, which you're not going to get when you've got Aguero, when you've got Sani, when you've got Sterling, when you've got De Bruyne, when you've got David Silva, Bernardo Silva. They're always going to catch the eye. But he's he's the one player that. Um, puts out fires left, right, and centre that allows everybody else, including the fullbacks, to go and play the attacking game that we do. He's so disciplined in what he, what he does, and um, he's been brilliant. If I had to pick somebody, um, go on, you've got I, to I, pick I somebody. I've missed Raheem Sterling, Le- Leroy Sane out of this. It just shows you what a season it's been. Kyle Walker, Kyle Walker, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it could go on and on and on and on. I would have to go Kevin De Bruyne. I just think last season he was he was sensational. Um, this season he's just stepped it up to a whole new level of, um, as in world class performances Well it might be something we revisit that and one other thing I wanted to mention while we were talking about these players is Raheem Sterling he, he t- to me uh, it, certainly on on Sunday I thought that was his, I personally thought that was the best game I've seen him play his movement and awareness and his reading of the game and his, his awareness of where his teammates were seemed to me to be moving on to another level. Now, he's always had the ability to be fast and to be in the right place, and obviously he's been on the end of things, but he, he's suddenly now starting to get a football brain. Am I being unkind by that, by saying he didn't have it at, to the right degree before? No, I think he's, even going back to him being a young kid at Liverpool, I think he's always had that. It's, it's having a coach and a manager that's going to channel it in the right way and give him the confidence to go and do that. Um, I'm not saying under Pellegrini he, he didn't have that um, but if, if you remember when he played under Pellegrini but whenever he was getting the ball wide a lot of the time his first touch was always backwards he was always coming back inside looking to pass it he was always coming back to give it back to his full back or, or to go into a midfielder since Pep has come in and it's not always worked for him um, he's on the front foot all the time the ball comes into him his first thought is can I take my full back on can I get a shot off? Can I create a chance? The, that the other three things, and he said, and that comes with maturity as well. People forget he's only twenty three, and for a twenty three year old, he's played a hell of a lot of games already, um, and he's just going to get better and better and better. And you know, mentally, I think he's away from the ability wise. Mentally, he's done ever so well because people are always chipping away at him and chipping away at him. He's been absolutely brilliant to have twenty three, twenty four, twenty five goals from a wide player um, is is just unbelievable. I put the assists onto that and put the work rate onto that as well. He's, he's been brilliant, and I, I genuinely think he'll be England's main threat in the summer. Recent England internationals when Raheem's played, um, albeit because Gareth wants to play with three at the back, he's had a more freer role. He's been the biggest threat and the best player, um, and I do think he will be in the summer. Liverpool play tonight in the game that City had hoped to be in. Not interested in that. Well, I was going to say, you know, <laughs> where, where do you stand on that? I mean, you know, before, it was always the United-Liverpool rivalry. But it feels to me, after what happened in that the first leg at Anfield and the bombardment of the coach and everything, that the City fans I've talked to, and obviously I saw it at the time, now have a slightly different view. And, uh, you know, I, I, did a, I was on a Channel 4 programme last week about f- fans and everything like that, and I was talking to a Chelsea fan and, uh, off, off screen, and, and the, the, the attitude towards Liverpool has shifted a little bit, and all the City fans I've spoken to said, no, no, we want Liverpool to go out. Is that... You've already answered the question, I know, but do you think there's a... All seriousness, uh, I think it would be great for the Premier League to uh, have a team in the final. I do. I think it's great level. And you've got to give them credit. I still genuinely believe, and um, I'm not being biased here, that if Leroy Sané's goal stands just before half-time in the second leg, Man City going and win that tie. Without a shadow of a doubt. You know, and there was other decisions at Anfield that went against us, but we can't keep blaming decisions, although we would like to. Um... The only reason I wouldn't, well, two two main reasons, and I wouldn't like to see them get there. Um, one is Edin Dzeko, another one's Alexander Kolarov. <laughs> I was going to mention those two. I'm uh, glad you brought them up. They, they are not ju- just weren't fantastic players for the club. You know, I, I know them both personally. Fantastic people who have got a lot of love for the club and the city fans as well. You know, and after what happened in the Queen, you know how the scripts are written sometimes. After what happened um, in both Liverpool games and. Um, fans not being happy with the coach thing and um, the celebrations and everything else people were saying Liverpool have sorted Man City out and City can't beat them I just think it's ironic and written in the stars that um, Kolarov and Zeko combined to, to score the winning goals So do you think they can win that tie? The, the Roma I mean 100% you know, do you th- I do yeah. Any team that can come back from three goals against Barcelona can do anything 
Um, you know, the, the first leg in the new camp, I watched both games. Um, Barcelona could have been out of sight. It could have been seven, eight, nine, and for Roma to come back after that, um, to, one to go into that game believing they could win after the battering that they took in Barcelona um, was just fantastic. And they have, if they can beat Barcelona over two legs, come from three goals down, they can do. They can beat anybody. Now I know this is a subject I'll also explore a lot more in the remaining Forever Blues of the season. But looking forward to next season, because we're talking about the Champions League now, how far is City away? I mean, obviously we talked about Liverpool tying, you're saying if Sane had scored and perhaps it was on a knife edge and... It's just instance. a low goal in the first leg. Yeah, well, exactly. And, you know, so, that's... and it's a legitimate argument, but but so, so on that basis, are City ready to win the Champions League now or do they still need something else, some some more, one or two more big players or whatever, key players in certain positions? Um... I genuinely believe that that they're ready to win it now. Um, I think that Pep Guardiola won't believe that. He'll want to push them and push them and push them. And look, I've no doubt about it that there's no massive construction needed with the squad in the summer. Um, you know, Chiki Bergera, Stein, and Pep, they'll know exactly who they want to be. And I would be really surprised if there was any more than two or three players that came in. Um, Big maximum. ones, do you think? Or. Um, I don't need to talk about big ones, you know. You, you look at the signings he's made, there's been no real superstars in the signings that Pep's made. It's all been about age, it's all been about quality and all been about improving. You know, you look at Kyle Walker, you look at Benjamin Mendy, by the way, fantastic to see him back at the weekend. Laporte, John Stones, Ederson, all 24 years and under, you know. Um, so it could be somebody that not necessarily is a Galactico at the moment, it's a rising star that... But somebody that the manager believes will be and will improve the team. Um, going into next year, um, I think we've got a real chance of doing it. I think back to, first and foremost, winning back-to-back -back Premier Leagues is, is the hardest thing that has been seen in recent seasons. You know, I think it's 10 years since any team done that, so it shows you how difficult that is. But then to go into the Champions League, they'll be the same. We'll be Real Madrid, Bayern Munich playing each other tomorrow in the semi-final. Barca will be there again because they'll be hurting what happened. PSG will invest heavily. But if you look at this, the squads that all these teams have got, and include Liverpool within that, man for man within the squad, I think City have got better quality all the way through. Good, good to hear, good to hear. Right, we're going to talk to David Phillips right after this. Oh. I, I mean, Cheeseman, this is Forever Blue, an hour City chat each and every Tuesday night on XS Manchester. On Wednesday I'm here, tomorrow it's with Steve Shanieski and Joe McGrath, who are going to talk about football generally. It's always a bit of a laugh. Uh, we always have quizzes, and uh, Steve's a United fan, so and he's a comedian, which seems appropriate. So we'll, be, we'll have him tomorrow night. But tonight it's all City all the way. Now on Saturday uh, there were it was sunny before the game, sunny after the game, and City of course had a glorious day against Swansea. Take you back now. Uh, well, obviously some people I can't take you back to because you perhaps weren't born. But I'm going to take you back in my little time machine to 1985 and a lovely baking hot day at Main Road. To playing Charlton and all the Blues needed to do that, that day was win and they would be promoted to the top flight and they did 5-1, two goals, what about a rasper by the man who's joining us now a certain German-born Welshman Mr David Phillips, good evening David Good evening Ian, how are you? Not bad at all, got Paul Dickoff sat alongside me as well. Dave, how are you buddy? Hey Paul, long, yeah, long time, time mate, mate. Exactly. I believe you two are intertwined in terms of, um, of, of the way that um, that you know each other, you want to explain that, Paul? Yeah, well, um, my wife Jan was really good friends with Fiona, Kingsley Black's wife, and obviously Kingsley and Dave were at Forest for at the time, so we had a couple of lemonades together at some point, mate, didn't we? Yeah, only half, though. Yeah, half lemonade, <laughs> with ice. <laughs> Ever the professional. <laughs> what, do you, what do you remember of that 85 game then, Dave? Because you were, you were definitely one of the stars that day. Well, obviously, obviously scoring the two goals, which was uh, very important to uh, to make sure that we got promoted. Uh, it was a full house at Main Road. Um, it was just a, a beautiful day. As, as you said, I scored a couple decent goals as well, scored a few during that season. And uh, the one thing I always remember is getting interviewed after the, after the game. And I swore on the radio. Really? Uh, it's the Whoa. first and last time that I've ever done it. So uh, there were a few abiding memories, but... 
getting promoted that day, uh, scoring two goals that day, was just a, a great season, not only for myself, but also for Manchester City as well. You scored a few few like that, long-distance shots. Did you watch Kevin De Bruyne at the weekend and think, oh, he's only doing what I did for City back then? Oh, yeah. So he, he must have seen some of my videos, to be honest with you, <laughs> if he has a VHS, of course, but uh, we move <laughs> Peter on. Peter Max. Him, but, uh, he's, he's a special talent, isn't he, Kevin De Bruyne? Um, and it's been an exceptional season for Manchester City. Just a shame it didn't work out in a Champions League. Well, what have you made of City then? I mean, from our point of view, very close to it. Paul and I are, are a lot of the games. Obviously, I'm at all the games. Paul's at most of the games. We've, he's not jetting around the world talking to City groups everywhere. But the, the, the football has just been like living in a dream. Perhaps you're a little further afield, David. Is that the way you see it? Yeah, I do. I'm say uh, I'm involved with, with with Spanish football, and I saw a lot of uh, good things when Pep Guardiola was at Barcelona, and exactly what he was doing at Barcelona, Bayern Munich, is what he's instilling into his uh, players at uh, Manchester City. The way that they're able to to play out the back, you know, they've got talented players from you know from the goalkeeper right through to the striker, players who are quite adept at, to get themselves out of tricky situations. And if they make mistakes, then so be it. They learn from it. Uh, but they've got a, a host of talented international footballers and they're just a delight to watch. What's your connection then to, to Spanish football, Dave? Well, I, I, I'm actually uh, with La Liga, uh, which is on a, a broadcasting network, one of the, the biggest in, in the UK. Uh, I've been doing that for eight years and uh, it, it's something that I've, I've always enjoyed watching Spanish football as well. So I've, I've been blessed that I've been able to, to commentate on the likes of Lionel Messi, Ronaldo, Bale, uh, not week in, week out. But uh, it, it's great. It's, it's a lovely job. It's a great job. Uh, but who knows what's around the corner? Is it true then that uh, one of the recent Barcelona games when they weren't playing that well that the opposition fans were singing you're just a poor Man City? Were they, were they actually singing that? Because somebody told me that that was true. Well, I, I can't clarify that one, to be honest <laughs> with you, but uh, maybe there were a few City fans in there at the time. Uh, Most have gone out to Barcelona for a few drinks or whatever, but uh, uh, it's the same with everyone. You can't, you can't have a season where you're going to be absolutely perfect. You're going to have your little dips, your little troughs, etc. is how you actually get over and rectify them. But uh, same with Barcelona. They've had an excellent season this year. Same as Manchester City, albeit that uh, it was just a, such a shame in the Champions League that uh, Man City weren't able to to overpower Liverpool. If City were playing in La Liga, do you think they'd win it? Tough question. Uh, certainly the, they would be in the top three, I would imagine, especially when you have the likes of Barcelona and Real Madrid. Uh, they are a strong side. They, you know, they've got money to spend as well, Manchester City, of course. But uh, who knows? Um, but they need success in the Champions League if they want to elevate themselves into you know, one of, being one of the greatest sides in, in, in the world. David, if Cheesy put me in the spot before him and was asking me about City's Player of the Year this year and asked me to pick between Salah and Kevin De Bruyne, were you surprised that Salah got it ahead of Kevin De Bruyne? I think with Salah, he's, he's, he's had a phenomenal season, uh, scoring the goals from where he is. But listen, at the end of the day, I'm, 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 I'm a blue, I'm not a red. So I would go Kevin De Bruyne at any time you want to talk about it because that's the way it was. That's the way it was when I was back in you know, Manchester back in 1984-85 when I first went there. You know, I bought a place in Summerfield uh, in Wilmslow, uh, had some issues with the house. They wouldn't rectify those issues and found out the builders were all Man United fans. So <laughs> that tells you a lot. Nothing should surprise you, Man United years. fans. <laughs> That's interesting to listen to you talk so passionately about City. I mean, in terms of appearances, I think you made just under 100, didn't you, David? And uh, in the teens, the goals, etc. And you were there for two years. You probably spent longer at other clubs, but you clearly have a strong identity with City then. Oh, I do. You know, uh, it's, it's the first club I had when I moved from Plymouth Argyle for 65,000, you know, which was a, a mere snip back in those days. But uh, having the two years at Manchester City, you know, they, they were they were great. They were great times. You know, I got up to no good sometimes. I had a neighbour of mine, it's a nice little story, who uh, who was one of the, the the captains at Monarch Airlines, and uh, sometimes we play a game at uh, Main Road. He said, well, "What are you doing?" I said, "Not a lot." I said, "The the missus has gone down Cornwall. Oh, do you fancy flying off to, to Ibiza?" 
So we used to fly over to Ibiza, have a few drinks in, in the cockpit, and fly back home again. So, uh, you know, th those are the sort of things that I used to get up to. And, I, and I've always remembered those days at Manchester City um, and, and the players, obviously, who... I uh, worked with, and we had a little group, myself, Graham Baker, Andy May, Steve Kinsey. We were known as the uh, the Magic Circle. Uh, Billy McNeil didn't particularly like it all the time, um, but we were very, very close. We had a great time, and uh, during the course of those two years, I had some special moments. What about Mark Lillis? We're chatting to him a little bit later on. Who, Boona? No, he likes a curry in, doesn't he? <laughs> He's just been out in India for seven months. He'll have enjoyed the curries out there, won't he? Well, I think he enjoyed it before he went out there. I think he enjoyed it in the time I was there as well. But, uh, yeah, good good, good lad. I believe his uh, lad is, is doing well in goal as well, isn't he, Josh? Uh, yeah, yeah Rochdale, yeah. Yeah, so he's, he's doing really well, following his father's footsteps. But again, you know, a great character. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of good characters back in those days. I, you know, I think when you look at it, there was only myself and Mick McCarthy, uh, obviously being Irish. We were surrounded by a host of English and Scottish people as well. So uh, we had to look after ourselves sometimes. Hang on, Mick McCarthy. I know he's Irish. I know, I know I'm he's not from He's a Yorkshireman, isn't he? I know, he's from Barnsley. But, you know, listen, there's, there's a lot of plastic paddies around, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> but we haven't got... We've got a real Scotsman sat in the studio here. Do you, what, can you match David's tale there about day trips to Ibiza? Yeah, I, I never came back the same day, though. That was the only difference. <laughs> 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 and definitely nothing I can repeat at 6.34 on a Tuesday night. <laughs> What were the happiest times then, David? Was it that 5-1 that you had at City? Um, yes, I would say that, that, that was a pinnacle for that, that first season I had at, uh, at Main Road. And uh, it turned out to be an excellent season, you know, scoring quite a, a lot of decent goals. Um, a couple um, goals of the month as well on the, on the BBC. Um, but there, there was one of the goals as well, um, which... Uh, became goal of the month, and that was the the goal against uh, Carlisle United. And I seem to remember that one. And it was very early in the game, and we had a corner. And the ball came out, and I hit it from about 30 plus yards. And it just went like a three iron. You'd know that, Dicko, wouldn't you? But with your golf as well, like a nice little three iron, just going and just rising steadily. And then it hit the uh, the roof of the net. We lost that game 2-1. Uh, I think Malcolm Poskett scored twice that, that day and uh, we came in afterwards and Billy McNeil just started ranting and raving and, and then he blamed me for the defeat. And I said, why are you blaming me for the defeat? He said, well, you scored too early. <laughs> and I thought, are you serious? You can never win, can you, Are you serious? But, um, you know, so magic days like that, you know, scoring lovely goals. Uh, but just being with the, the, the people in and around uh, Main Road and... Was it was it Helen who used to ring the bell? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I still remember her all the time, and you know it, it was just a great atmosphere to to be around all the time. So it was different, special, more special than where else you'd been. I mean, Plymouth being your first club, I'm surprised perhaps that that isn't closer. Or Coventry, where obviously you played a lot of time at Coventry, didn't you? Yeah, I did. You know, listen, um, I have special moments with virtually all the clubs. I, will, I was with, you know, apart from when you, uh, and, and Paul may clarify this as well, when you come to the latter end of your career, you, you may not enjoy it so much. But starting out at Plymouth, you know, we got to the um, FA Cup semi-final in 84. I made my uh, Welsh debut against England. We beat them 1-0 at the race course. So there are happy memories there. Obviously what we've, you know, discussed at Main Road and in and around Manchester, uh, Coventry, Winning the FA Cup in 1987, um, the four years I had at uh, Norwich where we finished third in the Premier League when it first came out, reaching the quarterfinals and um, having the player of the year at Nottingham Forest. Um, so they, they were happy memories in, in a lot of good clubs. Um, and I'll always remember it and I'll, I'll, I'll never forget them. And uh, it, it was always great. But there's going to be a time at some stage, hopefully, where I'm actually going to come up to the Etihad. You know, I still haven't been. Um, I know a couple of people have asked if I can get up, but obviously working during uh, the weekends is always very difficult. Um, but I said, who knows what's around the corner and hopefully uh, I'll get up there soon. Great to see him, Paul, wouldn't it? I'm sure we can sort that out and we can have another half a lemonade, Dave, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, as long as you're buying and you're not putting your hands in your... Uh, what, well, again? Yeah, uh, I'll say Dicko's one of those people he can peel oranges, like, in his pocket. He's, <laughs> he's so tight, it's frightening. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know it, it, some people will look at City these days and say it's all about the money. 
Um, and obviously money does play a part, we can't ignore that, but how, how do you look at what's happened to City since you left and the club? Because it's completely unrecognisable now, isn't it? Well, what it is, obviously, moving from Main Road as well, um, you know, to, to the Etihad, and uh, you know, I believe the training facilities are one of the best around. And uh, when, you, when you see that, yes, money, money comes, money talks. It's how you actually apply it. You look, you look at um, Chelsea, for example, with a brand of the amount of money that he's gone and chucked into the club. Uh, but you see the amount of managers that have come in and out of Chelsea. It doesn't happen so much recently uh, with Manchester City, but and that's the way you need. you need. You need to have that momentum. And when you have somebody like the likes of Pep Guardiola, the way that he brings in his uh, new innovations, etc., et um, it, it, it must just be a, an absolute joy to be around. You know, I hear a lot of people who go up there. One of my uh, golfing partners' um, sons go. He's a season ticket holder, and he goes up there every week, away every week, and he just absolutely loves it. Uh, and he said it's just a phenomenal stadium. In and around, you've, you've got your stands, um, you know, with music blaring out, etc. And it's just a, like a, as if you're going to like you know, the Euros or the World Cup, and you have your little square, and you know there's there's a lot of festivity and, and a lot of joviality going around. Oh, you've got the City Square experience to have yet, David. Uh, you'll enjoy that. Just just a final question, then, really. Obviously, you um, stood, you know, been involved in La Liga for you say eight or nine years or whatever. You'll have seen the beginning of Pep Guardiola's career. We know that he came up through the coaching ranks, that is, through yeah. through the youth setup, then into the first team. Is Pep Guardiola the best coach in the world? That, that, that's the question. It's always a difficult one because you, you'll you'll get some people who who may not like his, his style of play, uh, and that's what. How can you not like of. his style of play? Yeah, well, that, that's the thing is that you you, you get some people who, who absolutely frustrated that all of a sudden they're just keeping the ball all the time. Now, as a you know, as a technician myself, I love to see that. You know, it may not end up with the, you know, a, a direct shot. Sometimes, you know, I'm saying, look at back in our days, Dicko, as well. You used to get the ball wide and you used to cross the ball straight away for yeah. the centre forward. It doesn't happen anymore. You know, you, you try and build it up and then you try and, it's like a game of chess. You want to try and pull somebody out of their position and work it. Listen, I love his style of football. You know, people turn around and, and, and talk about Mourinho. Is he a better coach? Is he a better manager than Pep Guardiola? Not for me, and it's not just because he's in the red half of the city. I just think he's more direct, but everyone has their own philosophy how they want to play football, but give me Pep Guardiola's philosophy any day. I think the biggest thing for me in that one, Dave, is whether, when Pep came into the squad, whether he's inherited or he's made signings, he's improved every single player. 